everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today at Be The We are here live. I'm Julie, and I have with me a very special guest. This is Leisha Ramos, and she is an incredible bead embroidery artist, and we wanted to share her talent with you. And so she's brought a lot of wonderful pieces here to show us, and she's going to talk about what inspires her, what got her started, how to, you know, come up with ideas and how to sell your jewelry, a whole bunch of different topics we're going to touch on. And we are also joined by another very special guest. We have Sarah Diamond, our co-founder here at Beta Halik. And she's going to be here with us sharing some thoughts with Leisha as well. And Kat is here too, but she's behind the camera today. So as you're asking those questions, which we want you to do, please ask questions. We'll try to answer them live, but it's going to be Kat today who's going to be helping you with those. So. Let's go ahead and first start by looking at some of these wonderful pieces that Leisha has created. Now she is a bead embroidery artist, so if we want to take a look over here, we're just going to do a quick pan so you can start to see some of these pieces and we'll come back and look at them in more detail in just a little bit. But I want to show you some of this incredible artistry, just the detail and the fine work that Leisha has done. Beautiful stuff, Leisha. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so Leisha, how did you get started with this? This is all very beautiful. Well, if you take a look over here, Julie, there's a picture of an opera singer, my mother Rosa. She was a New York City center opera singer, a soprano in the 1930s through about 1960s, wore beautiful costumes, so I was exposed to, she made them all herself, costuming and adornment. Plus my um, great-grandmother and grandmother were thread artists from Italy. So I learned at their um, knee side a number of embroidery techniques and I incorporate a lot of their pieces in my material. I recycle hat pins. Oh, how nice. I recycle a lot of old buttons. You'll see very small ones in some of the pieces. Can you show us a button? Yeah, I'll show you some of the buttons here. These are a number of the buttons. Now, uh, where are these buttons from? These buttons probably were manufactured in Germany, maybe in the 1930s. Oh, wow. These are buttons. Oh, okay. These are they are, glass or? Are, these are glass, and they may have had a shank broken on them. These were her buttons. These are check glass. So let's take a look at these. So, so these are the typical button that you might oh, remember. Oh, a two-hole button. A two-hole button and a two-hole button. These are all her buttons, which I made into a little cuff. These were her vintage buttons from the 1950s. She was That's a serious gorgeous. button collector, and it has a little button clasp. That's beautiful. This piece has some of my great-grandfather, my grandfather, actually, cufflinks. You can almost see them here, and I would take the backs off and use them. So you see the little metal components yes. on this bib? Yeah. So I love that you're incorporating these older elements. It really makes them unique this piece, and one I of a kind. I think I mentioned, but I would like to highlight it again. It's a hat pin. The hat pin was broken. So the so top is Bakelite, and this would have been the bottom. It mm -hmm. had a pin in it. It was broken. And I used a little painting of a Klimt drawing I had, and I repurposed it into a little portrait using my grandma's hat pin. Gorgeous. Is, that a, is it a brooch or... This is just a little a um, portrait, and I yeah. keep it on a little tiny easel, and I have it next to some Gorgeous. other mementos. As I mentioned, my grandparents were um, collectors, Victorian collectors, and they had many, many beautiful objects. Yeah. My grandmother would have been on the Titanic. She would go back and forth to Europe. Good so goodness. I found many beads, hat pins, buttons, cufflinks, and other adornment items in my 1860 home that I grew up in. So I was surrounded by beautiful little objects used for decorative purposes and costuming. Wow. And many of those are incorporated here. Here's a cameo from my grandma that was probably broken from a bezel that I'll figure out how to use in a finished piece. And you were showing us earlier a great little tip you have about how you're able to incorporate some of these vintage elements that maybe have a more um, dimensional back or hollow back. You were telling us how you were able to work them into these pieces and what was your t what was your trick? Well, you have the product here, a beta holique, a crystal clay. I think it's a two-part clay. Mm -hmm. It's a two-part So epoxy. you need to fasten on the back of an uneven button. This happened to have been a pendant made out of a shell. Let it harden and now you have a flat base with which to then attach to your backing 
I see you also have lacy stiff stuff. So typically I would now attach this with some holding E6000 glue. That's another one of your products. And then start my palette of bead design. This is an example of a very a crooked, uneven donut shell. So I only had to use a little bit of the epoxy. Oh, it's quite clever. These are brass stampings. These are reproduced from, I believe, 1920s or 30 molds. They can be purchased. I think you have some at Bita Halik, but also using the epoxy clay two-part to make the strong backing that allows you. Now, one thing I will mention about the two-part epoxy, which is great, is you don't have to bake it. So right. it is an air-dry clay. You mix it up, which is great, because you wouldn't want to necessarily bake an old vintage piece. You want to be able to have it just air harden. So I think that's um, a great tip to be able to use some of these irregular-shaped objects. So what are some of the other techniques you've used in your pieces? Well, so we, we started to talk about materials. A tip I have for lacy stiff stuff, which is the best. I mean, it's not felt. It's a polyester bound material. I dip it in tea, and then I have a nice light brown color. Oh, that's a good or tip. Or I buy another product from Nicole's backing. She's online, sells at Etsy, comes in colors. Or I dye it myself with a Easy Ritz dye, because I do want the backing not to show through the bright white of any of my pieces. Mm. Yeah. That's one tip. Another tip is, what do you use on the back? I'd like the back of my piece to look as good as the front. So I want the color of either suede or ultra suede. You have this pattern here, and I've used this material, which I believe is one of your products, on the back of this piece. It's just a different pattern. Now that, and it's very lightweight. That's the Lily Pilly um, patterned ultra suede? Yes. Is that, yes. That's what it is. And it's worth it to get it's it because, gorgeous. again, with this piece of artwork, you want to have the whole piece lightweight. So your choice of materials, and you'll notice in this piece, this is heavier leather. This is not ultra suede. Yeah, that's quite sturdy. Yeah, this is a little portrait I have, and I make bead embroidery pictures for people of a baby of picture they have or a favorite button or oh, wow. like a belt buckle and then you could just put it on a little easel so this would require a stronger backing which is a scrap of leather I had versus the ultra suede so that the piece is more comfortable to wear. All my pieces are designed to be very lightweight oh, even the substantial pieces. That is really light. And that's, that's some painted shell. This is gorgeous. Yeah. So how would you go about designing this? So do you start with the center piece? How do you come up with like your well, color I, palette and your design choices Oh, that's here? a great question. And that's one of my favorite parts. And what parts. are these beads <laughs> that okay. you are using? So each piece is different. Um, let's talk about maybe these three first. Okay. My husband is a miniature artist, and because I spend so much time beading, he would get a little resentful. Some of the <laughs> audience may know that. So I in, um, encouraged him to sculpt some feature pieces for me, which are the center pieces. I have four here today. One, this is a Medusa that he hand sculpted and hand painted. Two moons, mm -hmm. and this piece, an Art Nouveau gal. I oh. like the period of art uh, jewelry from probably the late 1800s. Victorian through about Art Deco. So what did, what did he sculpt them he out of? He uses Sculpey. Oh, okay. He That's... may or may not make a mold. This is made with a mold after. A mold allows you to reproduce the piece, mm -hmm. but I only want one of a kind. So typically it's one piece sculpted. These are a little bit more my pricier pieces. And he also did the snakes on the Medusa. Once I take the feature piece and I decide what I want, he and I discuss the color palettes. My criteria is keep it simple. I've seen a lot of beautiful bead embroidery. It tends to go overboard. It looks a little confusing, chaotic. Three to five colors and different values and tints. Mostly the muted gold tone Renaissance color palettes are what I like. Now here's one that's a monotone color. We want to look over at the moon and I've kept it all in the various values and tints of off-whites and beiges. By the way, my grandmother's buttons are all surrounding that moon. They're called bullet buttons. And they would have been fastened on her children's uh, linen undergarments in the 1900s. <laughs> so those are 1900 buttons thrown in there. What was I going to do with them? They turned out to be a very nice circular bead enhancing the moon. Well, it becomes really an heirloom piece. Right. So, so many people who stop by my booth or whenever I'm at a show or an exhibit, I've done a few galleries. I was fortunate to be in Tucson, Arizona doing a show. And people want to have their pieces incorporated. So I do do some workshops. 
and I have some handouts and instructions and with the technique of adding the clay to the back and learning the basic three stitches for bead embroidery are the back stitch, which is a simple stitch, the brick stitch, and maybe a stack stitch. So those are three stitches. They're in the back of most of the bead and button mm -hmm. journals that you can get or any bead magazine shows those yeah. three. You can add more stitches and go into peyote and some other mm -hmm. more complex off loom weave stitches. But if you want to start something very simple, just take a look at this end piece and pretty much anyone can learn the back stitch and the stack stitch and the brick stitch in about a two hour session. Wow. And we do have videos actually on all of those stitches at beadaholic.com and on our YouTube channel as well. So people can learn it from video form mm -hmm. if, if they like as well. I, I'd like to plug that. <laughs> may I plug that? You yes. May, yes. Okay. Actually, can we rewind a little uh, about? Sure, go right ahead. One of the reasons I'm here uh, in on this instead of Kat is that uh, Leisha and I have known each other for 20 years. 20 years. We used to work together in a whole nother industry. And uh, the funny thing was, I was at that time a dabbler in beads. I could barely string three beads together. And uh, Leisha was also a beader. And she came in my office one day and dropped some copies of Bead and Button, I believe it was, bead stringing, on my desk. And I was flabbergasted <laughs> that there were actually publications and that this was a thing. I'm, uh, <laughs> I was quite naive. And uh, I can safely say that Leisha changed my life and I would not be here at having founded Beadaholic if it wasn't for Alicia tossing those magazines on my desk one day. You're too kind. And then, so then years later, I called her up and she came in in a technical capacity to advise our and some business operations. And then what happened? Then I took off because I was still doing primarily a little off-loom work, bead stringing, and I'd always been interested in cabochon beading. There was a lovely designer here who gave me some sample cabochons. That was Andrea. Andrea, and a uh, book by Jamie Eakin, I believe it's called Cabochon Beading. And I started to teach myself from the book and the inspiration of being around Sarah and her design team. And I would come in and do some of the other technical work and be re-inspired. And now there's this fabulous enterprise that blows me away. <laughs> I do want to mention to your audience and to reiterate what Julie said, the instructional videos on Beadaholic are probably the best online. Oh, I have well, done you. many, many of them. <laughs> All of these techniques that I use are in various sh um, uh, instructional videos here. You just got to Google that beautiful aspect of the website. Sit down, you'll hear Julie's voice. You could pick up some of these materials and pretty much there's no technique here that you won't see on one of those videos. We'll so I, I want to plug that because I did learn myself and this is a piece that I was going to say, the bezel. I did peyote bezel and I did not do backstitch on this piece. This is shibori, which is the using of silk to incorporate with bead embroidery to make a cuff. And oh, guess what? Oh, there we go, pattern. backing yep. again, one of the uh, Lily products you mentioned. Lily Pilly. Lily mm -hmm. Pilly. Mm -hmm. And this is nice because it's a cuff and it fits very easily around. So, so this is the silk right here. Did you yes. dye it yourself? No, I didn't. This okay. one I bought, this one I redid. Okay. You can see it's simple. I Actually, these are my old grandma's scarves. I added <laughs> a little dye and bleach. You've pleated and then twisted. And then shibori is a whole other technique that could be for another topic and artist. But mm -hmm. I like shibori. Um, I've done some soutache. I don't have any soutache pieces here. I use my grandma's ribbons. That's another technique on your videos that can go very well with bead embroidery. So bead embroidery is, to me, the most complex of the uh, bead skills because there requires a lot more creativity in working with your palette and you're not doing the same stitch over and over again. You've really got to stop, start, think about your palette, put it down, I probably spend three to four hours at the most at a piece, then I need time to break. This piece is, that I'm wearing is about 70 hours of work. Good wow. Lord. Uh, well, that's I just a want great to show. Tip to look, I see, do a, a, little bit I see a vintage piece here. Guess who referred me to vintage? Gosh, who? <laughs> who Guess who, was who that? that could have been? I don't know. Oh. Guess who spent oh, hours this, orienting though. me to some metals and findings that I was not aware of? I'm seeing crystal. This lady. Carnelian. Turquoise, uh, stick pearls, uh, 
glass. Let me plug Jamie Eakin again. She's got a book on how to design tassels and how to design fringe. For those of you who do want to do fringe work or tassel work, get those books. They're wonderful and they really teach you how to do a little bit more of the complex worker here. If I can mention any more materials, I'd like to talk about German glass. These are available. I don't know if you have them, but we a lot of these cups German. use German glass. They yeah. look like opals. Yeah, we have. We did get hold of some German glass. I mean, it is a vintage material. It yes. is limited. It's not something you can buy new materials of. And um, when we find it, we do get it in. And you could do a search on our website for German glass. I'm not actually sure what what has is left after having been <laughs> well, yeah. well I do. One, one of my tips is and I'm sure many of your customers and our audience today would know that when you go to flea markets or estate sales or garage sales you'll find broken jewelry in them you may find some components that you can then repurpose into some of these types of pieces absolutely mm -hmm. and we do have a question Kat's gonna let us know yeah, Joe is asking if you've ever tried to make a belt with this technique. Oh, okay. So the question is, Joe is asking if Leisha has ever tried to make a belt using these techniques and some of these pieces. I have. I have refurbished other materials on an existing belt and added to it. So yes, Ooh, I guess fun. I have. So <laughs> most of them are stretch belts. I've okay. made a few um, hair ties. I I've made compacts. I don't know if you sell these at Beta Hall Eek, but this is basically glued on the backing, but I still did all the bead embroidery mm -hmm. for it using those vintage buttons we talked about earlier. Great. So you um, could kind of make a bead embroidery piece and glue it onto quite a lot of different things, like definitely. A, a hair barrette, say, or if you had a simple brooch backing, maybe your first effort That's was right. a small circle and... You know, well, the brass cups, I believe you sell some of the brass cups. I, yeah, they're fantastic. Right, so they come in different widths. These are probably purchased from Beetle oh, Hall A. So there's so a brass what is this cup. One? Here's a brass deep cup inside. in between. So here's the beadwork. You'd never know. And then the back is the leather glued onto the uh, cuff, which is sandwiched between the beadwork and the leather outer backing. So this is called the foundation, the beadwork, and then the outer backing. This is a thinner cuff. This is a collar, same idea, but this was a collar that I had. This one here? This one here. Oh, that one there. This one is a collar, sandwich, and this was just a plain metal collar I used to wear in the 1980s when I, oh, uh, before I knew I you. don't think I was born then. <laughs> 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 this was challenging oh, dear. because this is a more of a geometric art deco pattern, and I do use those German glass, and here they are again. Fortunately, I'm from New York City, too, so I'll, um, I buy materials from old warehouses. This is a, a choker. I love the colors on this. Yeah. And here's that brass again, which I put the uh, foundation. My grandmother's little bits of coral. I'm an Italian gal, so we use coral a lot in this. Is this the Those button? are the button. That's the button, too. Yeah, these are probably 1930 Czech glass. Oh, and then there's a contemporary crystal. Yeah. And I like to use uh, glass seed beads, size 8. I do use uh, Toho beads, is size that, 11. Is that, is that an 8 or a 6? That's an 8. And then, okay. So. And you know that beads, even the, from different manufacturers, same mm -hmm. size may be a little different. I have a nice assortment, a beautiful assortment Where'd of delicates. Where'd you get that? Somebody here remembered my birthday. <laughs> Somebody gave me a birthday gift of Delica's, probably a hundred in a little case. So I Aww. use my palette. Thank Very you. Very fun. You we, know, we, I'm going to interject one quick yeah. question. We have another question. Yeah, I'm actually getting a lot of questions on how long does it take for you to create all of these gorgeous pieces? Okay, the question is how long does it take to create all these gorgeous pieces? Well, if you look at them, they're not easy to assemble because it takes me maybe years to collect the elements. For example, I had collected this piece of agate and German glass maybe about four years ago. About seven years ago, I had gone to France and bought this fixture, which would have been on a belt buckle. I found a button shop in an old flea market. So I hold, held on to the piece, pieces. Maybe it takes me two, three years to have the mosaic. The actual design, probably I could spend between four to 10 hours in laying out a palette. I enjoy that. I enjoy playing with colors, touching the beads, laying them out. And then the actual construction could vary depending on the size of the piece. This is about a 15 hour piece. 
Here's about a, what did I mention? 70, 70 you said hour 70 piece. Hours. And then this piece might be a six hour piece. Okay. So it depends on obviously the size of the piece. Can we talk about this piece over here? Sure, for a minute? I love that piece. That's an interesting piece, piece to talk about. Yes. Um, first of all, can you tell me what's going on here? This piece is a combination. I'm going to move it over, we'll move it over a little you. bit. Um, I love Russian artwork. Many of you have maybe traveled to Russia. I have. And this is a hand-painted shell from a Russian artist. Mm -hmm. These are German glass cabs. These are my grandmother's buttons. And these are a combination of more contemporary and quartz stones. I entered a contest at Bead and Button about the value of light. Margie Deeb is a famous uh, author and I beater. Love, I love her books about the color. It's a very good if you're worried about use of color in your work and uh, I'm not that great at it actually um, I, I just love her books that to show you examples and show you how to use color how to combine color I believe she has three books out now and again if anyone's struggling with color and selection get one of those books Margie Deeb D-E-E-B oh yeah she's probably on every uh, Amazon and so every she major had, site she had a she had a contest in Beat and Button to describe how you work with color because she writes little articles I submitted this piece and this piece was done to support my colleagues and friends who've had cancer like I. I'm a cancer survivor. Pink, as you know, is the color for breast cancer. I did this at the Cancer Support Community here in Pasadena, California, where I'm inspired to work with women who and men who are diagnosed in treatment or recovering, and I teach them basics of beading and sometimes cabochon beading. I notice a difference in their um, energies, and the healing quality and the uplifting that they have when they touch different colors. And this was an example of working with pink and how it elevates you a little bit, especially if you're suffering with that. So I wrote an essay on it, submitted it to Beat and Button, and I won a contest, and I won most of the components in this piece. Wow. And I made a piece out of this. So That's I great. teach quarterly at the Cancer Support Community. It's a not-for-profit. Where is and that? it's in Pasadena, California, and it's located in the Humane Society. So oh. it's a combination of people who are getting healing with animals and people who are getting healing with cancer, and beating is one of the so meditative techniques. So there's lots of techniques. cats there? There's so many cats Aww. there, and I don't think Sarah needs another cat, to be oh, honest. Yes, I, I think, think Sarah's I plenty of cats. Aww. <laughs> so that piece is a very special piece. I feature it uh, quite a bit at my shows, and I promote fundraising for the cancer support community as a result of that. And That's you see great. pink in my brand title. And oh, this is a very nice. We were uh, talking with Leisha about the necessity to brand yourself as an ar a artist if you're well, if you're publicizing yourself or if you're selling. And you made this for your show? Well, I had a friend who worked for Andy Warhol. So what I Good decided habits. to, and for many people, turning your hobby into a business is, is a big decision. Many of us do beautiful beadwork, but to start to sell it and market it, handle the financial aspect, determine what the mm -hmm. best venue is, is a challenge. So you need to really do a close self-assessment. Once you've self-assessed and said, gee, I'm good at a lot of these things, which I felt I had some skills. I'd been in business for 35 years, 15 years before I met you. <laughs> I, was um, just I thought I had enough of the elements to do that. And then I looked at my team of nobody. I'm by myself. So I looked at all my friends, family members, whoever had skills. As I said, my husband, a sculptor, collectors from my family. My girlfriend, who was a graphic artist for Andy Warhol, she did all my signs and branding. Oh, wow. I wanted to mention something else since we've been talking about selling is packaging is important Very with jewelry selling. Do you want selling. me to grab that? Yeah, that, okay. that's something I think I do that Ooh, adds a unique actually, I don't touch know if I can. and again it's more of an heirloom personal item. I'm going to stretch. Actually, I think Kat's going to come and okay. help us behind the scenes yes. here. I don't want to pull on any wires. Because okay. you do sell your jewelry. I do sell my jewelry. This is a, just a display case. My husband's also a woodworker. Hi, Kat. Hi. <laughs> we get to see Kat. <laughs> If you want to close it, it's a carrying case and a display case. All my cases and all my pieces are designed with wood. I have my logo in my case. And then I wanted to point to, so when you display your jewelry, especially if you're going to cool. show, you need to think about that. There's many wonderful tips 
There's books on marketing, selling, displaying, but you need to think it through because mm -hmm. your jewelry is going to be competing with many other artists who do lovely work, but your display is a draw. Absolutely, and I had the good fortune of actually seeing your display and, and getting to talk with you a bit at one of your shows in Pasadena, and it was great. It was wonderful to see you all set up and be there talking to your customers, and I know I got a little bit of time with you, you were busy chatting, but it is so important to display your pieces properly, and we've talked about this, also finding the right fit for your jewelry and, and you? for you. Um, there's a difference in the types of shows. You know, you can do everything from you know, a craft bazaar, to a flea market, to a juried show, to an art gallery. There's such a wide range of selling opportunities and shows out there, and I think it's really important to find the one that's the right fit. Well, Julie, you helped me with that because <laughs> um, you and I discussed this. There are, are you going to sell online and compete mm -hmm. with Etsy, eBay, and people who sell components like Vita Halik, they'll make their own jewelry with all the instruction. Are you gonna to go to a gallery and they're gonna take a percent? Are you gonna do a pop-up shop? Where are you gonna go with this material? A home boutique? Mm -hmm. Julie said, well, cause she knew me. Um, you've got a personality and a sales style that might work with shows, stay with it. And I took your advice and so far I'm breaking even, let's say, and I can keep my hobby alive. <laughs> Aren't you, going to a show, being going to be at a show quite soon? Yes, I have a, another friend who's a musician. I mentioned my family being uh, my father a pianist, my mother an opera singer. Well, I know a cellist from the LA Philharmonic who does jewelry making and her husband's a bassist. And Sounds very fancy. We're going to open up a show <laughs> for one day on Robertson Boulevard. Very fancy. Beverly Hills, actually not that fancy. There's actually um, a little pop-up shop, you know, like a Halloween shop yeah. is a pop-up shop for one day. We'll be there December 2nd. So people will be able to come to, we will post, we'll, we'll, post, post, the, we'll post the details. Thank you so much. Uh, but so people will be able to come on December the 2nd, second into Beverly Hills. In Beverly Hills, and they will be able to see Leisha's work in person, you'll be able to purchase her work, you can chat to her about her work, and then you have your two colleagues have got their own um, display. Rather and fascinating I'll mention, work. Um, I have about 70 pieces. I got tips from a, a sales agent who helped me design not just the pieces, but the sales points, the mm -hmm. price points. And I have pieces starting from about 45 that go up to about $2,000. So you can buy gift items. I have smaller items. I brought some of the larger pieces mm -hmm. here just to display for the purposes mm -hmm. of showing materials and design technique. But I have some very small demure pieces working with metals and uh, metals, M-E-D-A-L, not metals. Oh. Um, so, and, and small pieces that might be only as large as this that are cabochon beading, that are unique also buttons. I've so if you're metal. interested, my grandmother. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so I think some of my current clients Maybe. that collect from me will travel, buy something, or bring something to me, and then I do do some custom work for those who've collected. I wanted to mention packaging and maybe pull this over if we could. These are a little unique. Nice. I mean, there's many ways to do packaging, and I think a number of jewelry designers who sell, but I had my grandmother's vintage napkins. I lived in a 19-room house, a Victorian home, can you imagine, stuffed with things. Wow. These were my grandmother's linens. She did all this tatting. Look at this beautiful tatting. Wow. This is a butterfly And you're giving tatting. these away? Well, with a certain price point, I oh. include the beadwork. It protects it. So I made the pouch out of the old napkin and then just attached my grandmother's linen so that it's a special giveaway gift with certain pieces. So I wrap yeah. the jewelry, I package it, you get a little nice. statement piece. And that makes it even a little more personal because grandma had hundreds of these. She had a large household and uh, I'm able to repurpose her things that she would enjoy. You know, how so. much of your, your personal possessions. Some of you may actually have linens and little Madagascars, they're called, from your families. Use them. I mean, even if I mean, I love the idea that yours are heirloom. This is heirlooms to wrap heirlooms. Thank you. Uh, but even if you don't have old napkins, it is a nice idea to think that if you can, if you have a little skill with the needle or okay. even with the iron on, um, that you could really make some unique bags out of just some regular napkins or some inexpensive cloth that you could get. Definitely. 
and uh, and make your own. No, no one will have the packaging that you have. And it really, I would imagine, is you know, it's, it's the whole package. You've got these lovely pieces, and then you're not just putting them in a plastic bag. Yeah. You're putting them in a beautifully protected package. It adds to it. I think that's a really nice tip for someone who's thinking about you know selling their jewelry or thinking about giving gifts is to try to add that little extra touch. Yeah, sure. I mean, if you went to Tiffany's, are they going to throw your diamond ring in a paper sack? Mm -hmm. you, you know, it's a matter of respecting the work that you've done and showing your buyers that this is, is something valuable and uh, they will... And there's a personal we, connection. And yeah. a lot of people say, well, how could you sell your grandma's things? Well, we had, I had hundreds <laughs> of my grandma's things and my great grand. I mean, what would we do with all those? They're sitting yeah. in old chests. Mm. Yeah, now they get to be enjoyed by a whole other group of people, which exactly. is Exactly. So that's hopefully a helpful tip. Use yeah. what you have. And we do have another question. Nicole Hi, is Nicole. asking, how do you decide how much you want to price each piece, each piece for? Okay, so the question is from Nicole. Hi, Nicole. How do you decide how much you want to price each piece for? How do you come up with your pricing? That's a great uh, question. I thought a lot about that. One is, you know, I studied um, other people selling before I started selling. And I always go to designers that did one of a kind artware pieces and got a sense of what their price points were based on similar work. There are a couple of bead embroidery artists in Los Angeles that do something akin to my work. So I took a look at their pieces at shows and got an idea. So that would be what I call price to market. What is the market bearing? I noticed that that same artist didn't sell much that day. I saw her again at another show. She sold very little again, and she was frustrated. So I knew her price points were not to market. I had a friend who worked for a, a number of boutiques, actually owned a boutique on her own, and got her advice. She said, you need different price points. So that's one thing, price to market and varying price points. The second tip that I learned was, what am I spending for materials? I know what I spend for these materials. I know what my limit is, and since I inherited so much, it's a little hard to price, but I also look at my labor. What would be the minimum per hour charge I would want on my labor? So if I did a 60 hour piece, let's say $10 an hour, $600, is someone gonna spend $600? Probably not. However, price to market with materials might be half of that, so I might cut it in half because I would be doing these pieces anyway since they're labors of love. Fortunately, I don't need to support myself on my bead business. I want to make a little profit, I want to cover my expenses, and I want to do more and more shows and introduce people to bead work. So my sales goals are a combination of my personal financial needs, what I feel is fair price to market, and how much I spend on my materials. So I have one tip how's if you that, don't mind me that, adding. That's that is, wonderful. I hope that answered that. I thought <laughs> it through. And a oh, one last point, show prices. Oh. Some of the shows I go into are pricey. I will be at the Pasadena Bead and Design Show, which is probably one of the best in the world, um, I think, for creative, one-of-a-kind, mm -hmm. unique art jewelry. I want to make about two times the show price. So when you say show price, you mean that it the costs... The boot, the electricity, the vendor's license, the sales you, permit. You pay for all of that up front, and it's up to you to make it back. Right. Yeah. So let's say for a high-end four-day show, you're spending about $250 a day. It's three days. What is it? $750. So twice $750, three times $750 could be a sales goal for what I, I view as the marketing and availability and access I get to people. And it depends on the show. So for my price points, I have to consider what I'm investing and where would my target audience come from? Who are the people who are going to buy these? These are not people who just want to throw on a piece of jewelry and go, well, it's probably an arty person, maybe a little middle-aged or above. Um, I'm not selling children's wear. So those things are factors that you take into consideration as you price your jewelry. Who is your target market and what are they willing to spend knowing that's your market? Which I yeah. guess you do here all the time. Yeah. yeah. I'm just going to give my little tip. You kind of touched on it, different price points. Yeah. I did, uh, when Bead Holic was quite small, uh, I was still selling at one of the largest swap meets in the country, I think, is the Rose Bowl. Uh, in Pasadena, and I would sell there once a month, and I had a table like this, covered with jewelry I made by myself, and I would say I was an 
intermediate beater. This was not top of the line stuff, but uh, I use high quality materials. And at a swap meet, people aren't necessarily go there planning to buy new jewelry. So to draw people into the table and to the $30 and $50 items, I set up some uh, racks with $5 earrings and $10 earrings, and very prominently signed and very cute displays. Mm -hmm. And I, time after time, I saw people arrested by these very, uh, I used picture frames. They were quite nice displays. And, and the price point, they, in their mind, they went, I'm going to investigate this. And they would investigate everything on your table, not just your, I don't know, they weren't loss leaders, but they were very inexpensive items that were quite easy for me to make. That's what I do too, is I have the varied price points and varied labor amount. So I might yes. make a higher profit on something that's really quick and easy to make, like maybe it takes me five minutes to make and I'm charging $15, but then that balances the pieces that take so long labor-wise. And you couldn't possibly couldn't charge, charge per, hour. per hour. Yeah. Yeah. So I learned with price points too is, okay, so I've done many shows now, so I can go back and look. I keep a little inventory of what I've sold. I'd say most of my pieces sell between $75 and $250. So you found like a sweet spot of where I, people... So I make quite a number of price points in there, and then I do give wholesale discounts, of course, for people who resell. So, for example, these I could sell uh, mostly between 145 to 150 so, And I've sold quite a few in this price point range. So, no, I'm not getting my labor in, but I've, I'll sell a lot, and then I have plenty to buy more materials, and there, there I am keeping on my art form. So that's a good break for me. And, and we do have another question, so I want to yeah. definitely get to that. A few questions. A few questions. One is, when you sell a piece, do you include where you've gotten the vintage button or where okay. your materials are from or any little story about the piece? I do. Uh, I'll, I'm going to repeat that just real quick because uh, with Kat behind the camera, she's not mic'd. So the question is, is you have all these base, you have these wonderful stories about where all these different ingredients come from, your grandma's buttons, different things you picked up on your travels. Do you somehow include that information with your pieces when you sell them? So as a person is, is taking them home with them, do they have some of that information? Yes, many do want the provenance, called the provenance of the piece. And if someone's buying a, probably a price point, 150 up, there's enough interest in the pieces. So what I do is I have a little branding card that describes generally the technique, and then I write on the back where each piece was. Oh. Sometimes I send them an email with a little more literature. For example, I love Muka and Klimt, the two mm -hmm. artists. Mm -hmm. This is a hand painting reproduction of a Muka. Alphonse Muka was an artist from the late 1800s uh, in Austria. Most people don't know mucha. Some do. Well, they think it's mucha. Mucha. <laughs> and mucha. I, or, lo I love his. I love, love his stuff. Name. And yeah. this is Klimt. Do you remember Klimt came out with that movie? This is a hand the painting. The woman in gold. The right? woman in gold. There yeah. you go. So what I will send a little. I always collect a business card if someone buys a piece of this size, and then I'll send a little internet link or a little bio on the artist originally who may have painted this that was reproduced in Russia in contemporary times. Um, I've sent uh, many people follow-up emails with further provenance information because it's a little piece of artware and they become super interested. So in addition to my notes on a little branding card, they may get a follow-up email with more detail. That's great. And actually, this is a question for Sarah. Okay. Everyone is very interested in our backdrop. Back <laughs> oh! <laughs> how, how that came to be? Okay, so the question is, or the interest is, is Sarah, can you tell us the story on this backdrop? And I actually know it because I was with you when you bought this. Okay, yes. Yeah. So um, the story is, I love I love textiles. If you went to my house, it's like my house is all like this. Uh, <laughs> it's just <laughs> rugs, carpets, hangings, sofas. Um, and, and cats. I mean, that's my house. So, and these I've are, been there. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and I tend toward the red end of the spectrum. And uh, I love these kind of, I'd say from, from the Indian subcontinent, I love this colorful embroidery and this style where they bring in the patchwork and you can still see the mirrors. And a lot of this fabric is pieces of old saris that have been over dyed. And um, I'm sorry, I don't know the exact region where they do this exact type of thing, but we were at the Tucson, Tucson uh, show a few years ago, and 
we were outside the to be true blue mm -hmm. and there was oh, I and again i don't know this vendor's name but they were just yeah. out they just out front of the building and they had all this gorgeous stuff f probably from india yeah uh and I went back for three days straight <laughs> and stared at this because it's the exact colors in my bedroom pretty much. And um, I just, it was one of those things when you're on a trip and you spend yeah. a little more. Yeah. And, and then uh, somehow it never got hung up behind my bed. And this, because this, okay, this used to be my office. The studio used <laughs> to be my office. So I hung it up in here. Um, yeah. And we've, we've just left it until we, um, we, we may change this. This may be going home with me. I don't know if I can leave this here forever. Ah, <laughs> but, there you uh, go. We've got to enjoy it, though. It really yes. is beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. It certainly goes with bead embroidery. I mean, there's all kinds of work on that that's uh, hand stitched. And I love, you know, in the theme of being inspired by other people's work, I love when when I find things where I see people have combined colors in ways mm -hmm. I wouldn't have thought to, and and yet I enjoy it so much, like. I'm not a purple person, but here's this purple with orange and red, and it, I think it looks great. And to be able to pick up on, I guess if I was a bead embroiderer, I would maybe go, oh, I'm going to try those colors. I know that's always been a big tip of yours for color palettes. It's like finding a top or a scarf yeah. or something that you like well, that this has is, a color palette. This is a bit much, out. but you know, you say you had a top with a pattern on. Mm -hmm. Actually, one of my most successful necklaces I ever made is I had a shirt that was like red and brown flowers. And I was going to a party and I threw together a necklace with garnets and smoky quartz. Mm. And Lovely. And it was just, I got multiple strands of the mm. garnets. I didn't even take them off the original string. That's one of my dirty little secrets. <laughs> so I just like stick them into a cone, you know. And then I hung this big, th and like, it was one of my best necklaces I ever made. And I would not have put those two colors together if it hadn't been for my shirt. Yeah. Well, I have a, an add-on to color. Um, I travel quite a bit internationally. I'm leaving for Australia and New Zealand soon, and I'll take a little uh, book with my color crayons and my little, you know, iPhone, and I'll take pictures of any colors that I observe, either in nature, when I'm on the boat, when mm -hmm. I get off, or some, someone's wearing something, and I keep a little color diary, and then I go, hmm. Ooh, so you, wow. you match your colored pencils or crayons? I, yes, to I what do. You see? And I carry, so I'm always, whether I'm doing beading or not, it's not always feasible to do this type of bead work when I travel, but at least I'm keeping my eye out for color palettes and then I'll go back to them if I find a feature piece or something that doesn't have a feature piece and I'll use my color diary because I've been inspired by my trips around the world. Oh, that's such a great idea. I never thought to yeah, keep a color know, diary. You know, coloring is big now. Oh, it's books. very soothing and calming. I mean, whoa, and, and you can buy your colors and you carry a little box of pencils. I so see. coloring is a soothing healing art and you don't even have to bead, but you'll be working with palettes and colors mm -hmm. and, and it stimulates you. I wonder if someone who's watching is who is uh, perhaps knows Photoshop or is kind of artistic and knows the digital format, you could almost keep a digital color oh, yes. diary in your phone or your iPad mm -hmm. as you travel if you technically technological oh, yeah. enough to summon up the color on a color pick. I mean, that would be a great thing to do. I uh, taught bead embroidery to a group of quilters, and they did all their quilting digitally. Can you believe this? All the quilting patterns come across digitally. You know, those oh, wow. mosaics, the stars, and good that's heavens. how they did it. Exactly so they would point. know. So they would know that it looked good before they did right. it. Right, and Isn't before they cheating? bought the fabric, <laughs> and they would design digital color palettes wow. with quilts and making these fabric appliques, and then incorporating some beadwork, but all started digitally, all the colors, and then they'd find the fabrics to coordinate. Wow. So that's a good example of how to do that. Do you, do you sketch your work? I do sketch my work sometimes I sketch a piece and um, I have a uh, I've been let's see embroidering since I was probably 12 so I do have sketches from when I was 12 I haven't used those and uh, it's definitely my 60 hippie days wow uh, I feel like, like I would love to see you put out a book that had like oh, finished pieces oh and nice. your sketches oh. oh that would be so great and like and your color palette diary and the provenance pages. thank you that would be so fun to that see that might head book. me into divorce though any more time <laughs> with beading is taking me a little further away from my guy so oh. i gotta keep that in mind it's a commitment he can be your secretary well 
That's why I'm impressed with the two of you that have made a passion, also your professional work. So for me, I'm still just a, a hobby gal that enjoys this. And if I could share with others and keep my hobby alive, I'm, I'm so grateful. Well, and we are so grateful that you joined us today and shared it because I think one of the best things about the beading community is we all want to help and inspire each yes. other. And we want to encourage each other and encourage this passion because it is such a joy. And just seeing all your lovely work, and it's so unique, and you incorporate so many wonderful techniques and different components. It's just a joy to see and you Thank know, you hearing Julie. your story and just your tips, and you're so open with your tips, and we just really appreciate you coming in today. Well, I would share the one personal note uh, from the healing aspect. When I was sick with can breast cancer to 10 years ago, I had my friend who was the uh, graphic artist who worked with Andy Warhol. Her name is Liz. She came down and said, Lee, you got to start embroidering again. You need to pick up a needle. And she basically pulled me out of my bed and my That's misery, great. put a needle in my hand, gave me my threads, and watched me and, and, and pushed me to start all over. And once I started getting back into my embroidery and beading, even though I was feeling pretty miserable, um, it opened up a new world to me, and hence the teaching of others, because it's a total healing art, and I advocate for the therapeutic side of beading in addition to the beauty and the adornment. So I wanted to just throw that out to uh, your audience, because I know many people are at home, and uh, beading is a wonderful hobby to take up for those purposes. Yeah, and I know yeah. it can be hard when you're in the, that yes, spot it can where be. it's you really hard small. to get start. Yeah, start just start. Start small, get a needle and thread, and it's joyful. They do know, research showed that, and I think it was Martha Stewart, that repetitive move, uh, hand movements, crochet, knitting, beadwork, trigger a positive chemical in the brain that releases the oh. positive chemicals for relaxation. And she did some research on that in her uh, magazine, wrote an article on it, and you know, she started also as a seamstress, Martha Stewart. So that really reinforced for me, wow, I'm really helping myself heal. And now you and you help others. And I help others, yeah. and this was the uh, testamentary to that. So I'm grateful that others can experience the joy of color as well as the actual construction and design. Uh -huh. Wow! Thank you so much, Lisha. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Lisha. Lisha. And just Thank a you. reminder before we sign off: um, if you want to meet Lisha, she is wonderful, and see these pieces in person. And you're in the Los Angeles area, please do um, go and visit her at her pop-up shop on December 2nd. We're going to have more information on that in the notes to this uh, broadcast, as well as in the comments section. And then also the Pasadena bead show she's going to be at in January, I believe. Right. That's at the Hilton here on Los Robles in Pasadena, California. And there's about 300 beautiful vendors there. Mm -hmm. So stop by, visit me, meet others, get inspired, and it you'll a, love the day. It is yeah. a really nice bead show. It's not... Some bead shows are just so overwhelming mm -hmm. and they feel very commercial. This yeah. this one is more, there's a lot more artists there. It's a, it's kind of It's the same exhibitor, Garam Badaggio, that ran the Two True Bead that you mentioned the earlier. The Bead True Blue, yeah. So yeah, mm -hmm. they're the same vendors very, and they travel around. They're pretty artistic people and yes. they love to have people stop by and just get inspired. Yes. You don't even have to shop, you can just get inspired. Yeah, if you're familiar with um, Pasadena area, it's near the Paseo in Pasadena. That's it's pretty right. close to it and it's a really nice show and some nice restaurants around. You can make a day of it. Great. So grab some girlfriends and, and do that. <laughs> or guy <Okay>. friends. <laughs> All right, exactly. So, well, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, please definitely keep leaving comments or questions. Kat and I will be checking them and answering. And have a wonderful day and a very, very happy Thanksgiving. Thanks. Bye.